Okay. Hi, my name is Liz Seaton, and I am a curator here at the Mariana Kistler Beach Museum of Art. Welcome to this program organized in conjunction with our exhibition, Sunrise Over Kansas, John Stuart Curry. I uh, just want to let you know it's open until February 28th. If you want to tell your friends to come visit, uh, they can see it through the winter. Before we begin this event, uh, we wish to acknowledge that the land on which K-State's campuses sit was the historic home of many native nations, including the Ka, Osage, and Pawnee. Kansas is the current home of four federally recognized tribes, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. The recognition that K-State and Kansas history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential to this museum, which seeks to create decolonized spaces at the university and increase the presence, promotion, and support of indigenous and other traditionally marginalized faculty, staff, and students. Okay, well, uh, we plan this program to include an introduction to the museum's collection of art by regionalist figure John Stuart Curry, um, a native of Kansas, and I will be doing that introduction. Uh, and that will, I think, last about 12 to 15 minutes. Then the main lecture by our distinguished visitor, Kenneth Bay, in the back of the room of the Gerald R. Ford Conservation Center in Omaha will follow. And I will formally introduce Kenneth now. I should preface that he has been working with us on various painting conservation projects for several years. And so we rely on him and uh, or trust his, him completely in terms of the projects he does for us. So Kenneth Bay is originally from the Hudson Valley region of New York City and holds an undergraduate degree from Yale and graduate degree in art conservation from the Institute of Fine Arts of New York City, New York University. He has worked as a painting conservator at the Cleveland Museum of Art and more recently at Omaha's Ford Conservation Center since 2008. The Ford Center is a regional conservation facility and serves as a division of History Nebraska. Its services include treatments of three-dimensional objects, works on paper, and paintings. Projects in the painting lab have included traditional and contemporary paintings, oil and acrylic that are in museums and private collections, and Kenneth's conservation work has even included treatment of on-site murals and stage curtains or backdrops. Well, okay, I'll begin my introduction of the museum's substantial collection of John Stuart Curry art. We have over 900 works in our holdings. And our history as a repository for the work goes all the way back to the period of John Stuart Curry's rise on the national scene in the late 1920s, early 30s. Um, he became associated with Thomas Hart Benton and um, Grant Wood and described as a regionalist with a capital R, um, which is sort of a category within the, the, the area or fit into the area of American scene art, which you may be familiar with, artists active in the 1930s sort of depicting the world around them, essentially. So in 1933, K-State, which was then called the Kansas State University of Agriculture and Applied Science, acquired this 1930 painting called Sundogs, which captures a meteorological and optical event in which ice crystals suspended in the Earth's atmosphere refract sunlight and make it appear as if two suns are on either side of the actual sun. And this is referred to as Sundogs, the title of the painting. Does everyone see, it's very bright here, but can you see a larger orb and then two smaller ones to the left and right? Sometimes in real life, those look like little rainbows on either side of the sun. So this work was one of three paintings that the university considered. Uh, Curry and his New York dealer, Maynard Walker, a native of Garnett, Kansas, made three works available for $500 each, which was half of the market value at the time for the works. And the university's relatively new Friends of Art organization led by art professor John Helm decided to hold a community election to choose one of the three paintings. So you had to buy a ticket to participate and the ticket sales revenue was used to make the purchase and Sundogs was the pick of the community. Former senior curator, Bill North, 
I'm yes, I've got a mic that goes to the live stream people and I will, yes, I will do that. So former senior curator Bill North um, explains that there was a kind of synergy uh, that brought the work to K-State and that had to do with uh, our Friends of Art, of course. It also was the, um, as he puts it, the willingness on the part of Curry to extend a generous offer in part from the fact that his mother was an alumna of K-State. And certainly he says both Curry and his dealer were eager to place a work in a public collection in the artist's home state. No institution yet had acquired a Curry work, so K-State was the first to do so. So the relationship between the artists and the state, despite this acquisition, was strained and had been for several years in, by the early 1930s when we acquired Sunrise or, or Sun Dogs. Uh, many Kansans didn't like Curry's portrayal of the state in such images uh, as his depiction of a baptism in a, a stock tank, an animal stock tank, and uh, his uh, inclusion of natural disasters in his paintings. And this is a very good example uh, at the state house. Like, yeah, the, you, sorry, I see something different. At the state house, you see the tornado in the left by the abolitionist figure, fiery figure, John Brown. And then the right, there is a prairie fire. So Kansans didn't like this, this kind of uh, dislike for Curry's work appeared in the newspaper and we have correspondence, uh, the sort of evidence of that. And Curry was especially unhappy when this scheme uh, of his, the mural project at the State House was cut short. He had planned to do the East and West Wing and the Rotunda, the round area in between them. And he was not allowed to go forward with it uh, because the legislature decided that they didn't want him to, to make changes to the interior of the building to do that. And he left for his home in Manhattan, Wisconsin, extremely discouraged. And his second wife, Kathleen, believed it, that this dis great disappointment contributed to his heart failure. He died in 1946 at the age of, four, nine, of, age of 48. And in fact, you know, after he left Kansas, left the farm that he grew up on north of Topeka, he did not return to live in Kansas. He lived in other areas of the country and then died in Madison, Wisconsin. So the relationship with Kansas and Curry was complicated. After Curry's death, he fell into some obscurity, but in the 1980s, K-State journalism alumnus Don Lambert struck up a relationship with Mrs. Curry, as he called her, Kathleen Curry, when he decided to develop performances in the persona of John Stuart Curry to help restore his reputation in the state. And Lambert approached Kathleen Curry as he, to ask for her permission and she was very encouraging. Then he facilitated, in addition to doing these performances, he facilitated a number of events uh, in Kansas after the meeting with Kathleen Curry uh, including an exhibition of Curry's work in the state capitol. He also worked with state legislatures, this is sort of amazing, to draft a resolution that formally, uh, a formal apology to Curry for the body's decision in the early 1940s to withdraw financial support for the, support for the remainder of the mural. And I, sorry, I haven't referred to this beautiful drawing that we have in our collection um, of Kathleen Curry. This was Curry's second wife. So then Lambert kept Kathleen Curry apprised of efforts to establish an art museum at K-State in the 1990s, and she made the decision to donate most of the remainder of the Curry estate to the Beach Museum of Art on her death. So she told him that she, he helped give her another sort of better feeling about the state. The gift came in to the museum in 2002, increasing our existing holdings to over 900 works, as I mentioned, and you know, we can boast that we hold one of the largest collections in the country. The Worcester Art Museum has a collection that's as large. Um, Kathleen Curry donated Curry's sketchbooks and some painting supplies to the museum in Connecticut in the mid 1990s. So what did we receive in 2002? Lots of work um, that included imagery from Curry's early art education, even boyhood drawings his studies uh, of the figure in Europe. He went to the Europe in the mid twenties to uh, take courses in figural drawing. And an, ex an example here, his preparatory drawings for some of his best known easel paintings from the late twenties, early thirties. And I'm showing you a drawing that was created 
more than five years before, almost five years before of um, these uh, hogs who are engaging with a rattlesnake. And so he's working out his composition there. And the one on the right seems to be closer to what he finally used. We also have some really nice studies of, uh, for murals that he produced. And here again is the State House and two uh, examples of studies for Kansas pastoral up at the top, uh, that study, and then the John Brown scheme on the bottom. And really interestingly, we also have a very large collection of his um, work uh, for book illustration commissions. So preparatory drawings and some of the final illustrations. And I'm showing you here the, uh, my friend Flicka, um, one, of the, one of the drawings and the final on the left, the final page from the book printed. So what we have here is a real treasure. Um, I, we raised, I was gonna talk a little bit about what we've done with the collection. We raised money for a conservation survey um, early on. And some of the works, uh, some of the works had been in the artist studio or all of these had been in his estate still. So they, you can imagine they were a little sometimes manhandled, you know, it, there were problems with them and they weren't ready for prime time. They weren't ready for installation. So we began some of the work conserving some of the works on paper that were in the poorest condition around 2012. Um, and then we drew on the collection for various exhibitions, but really it wasn't until 2014 that we really started exploring the collection in depth. And we did so through teaching. Um, I, with Linda's support, began to teach uh, seminars for undergraduates and graduates through the art department. And I'm showing you the class from 2018. Um, I've taught three seminars and every one of them has gone over to the state house. And of course, all the, muse all the museum staff have participated in helping me teach this course. They all should have a credit. It's a group effort. Um, so for example, um, with the teaching, we uh, concentrated on the illustrations, which no one had done any study of or publishing on. Um, and this group is shown looking at illustrations and bringing their computers in because they developed for the final project, a digital humanities website um, introducing people to three of the commissions uh, that, and we have several others and we'll, we hope to expand this. So this is the homepage and you could enter in and look at the My Friend Flicka um, images and texts that a group of students produced. So the other way besides teaching uh, or with teaching that we've um, kind of dug into the collection is through exhibitions um, that are all of, about Curry. And uh, one of those, uh, one of the classes I taught the students um, did the, created a checklist and did the research for an exhibition on Curry's early career. Uh, again, something not, uh, not thoroughly studied. We also organized an exhibition. I'm showing you the marketing image for it um, on Curry's depictions of the American West. And that was um, just open a few years ago, had to close slightly early because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And so this brings us to our current exhibition. Another example of our trying to look at Curry's work in our collection with maybe a few loans to complement it from a different lens. And with this exhibition, we uh, decided to focus on his use of the sunrise motif in his work. Um, the initial impetus though, was that we had, well, we wanted to tell the story of the conservation of a major painting in the collection called Sunrise Over Kansas. And that's what Kenneth is gonna talk about. Uh, but then I noticed uh, in all of my research and work with students and travel to look at the Worcester collection that there were an awful lot of sunsets in Curry's art. And I wanted to see what, how to, what to make of this. And so um, organize uh, this sort of presentation of the painting that's been conserved, which you see here, uh, and brought things in to put it in context. And basically, I think I developed an idea or an argument that after this point, Curry, which is 1935 when Curry made this painting, he, he made, in, in which he was making a very intense study of the sunrise and he produced a few other works at the same time, that after this point, he decided to use the sunrise motif in his work regularly and that he, he, he it carried different meaning, meanings. He used it in different ways in his art.
So I just wanted to give you a little background on the painting before Kenneth talks. Um, it, sorry. So I told you it was created in 35. And I told you that Corey was working on a series of large scale images um, of a ranch in Barber County, Kansas in South Central Kansas called the Hart Ranch. And so he is up on the hill um, taking in this view of the sunrise. And in the background at the, at the left, you see the Hart Ranch. And you see the ravines and the very red soil there in this territory of Kansas. And then in the very foreground, you can see a coyote or a wolf bringing a rabbit to its den. So Curry was known for uh, these, as I mentioned, these uh, natural disasters, tornadoes, um, thunderstorms, uh, anvil clouds, you know, predicting really bad weather. But these pictures were um, something different, very calm. Um, and the sort of looking for uh, ideas about why he would have made this shift at this moment to produce paintings like this, um, I turned to Lawrence Schmeckebeer, who it, interviewed Curry in the early 1940s for a book that he wrote about him. And he um, says that he believes that the timing of this painting and others like it had something to do with the fact that Curry had just remarried. Kathleen Shepard was her name. I, I mentioned her earlier, of course. He had a very unhappy first marriage and his wife had died, Clara Curry. And so he married uh, Kathleen one year before he made this painting. He also, you know, we can say he grew up on a farm and he probably had to get up at sunrise. And also that time of day is a good time to paint because of shadows. So that might've been um, a reason for his decision to choose that subject. And then at the same time, Schmeckebeer points out that this is right at the beginning of the federal art project and the New Deal programs uh, for American workers. And so he and, and Curry himself did articulate that he was, he saw it as a hopeful moment in American history. And so, and he did receive mural commissions from the federal government at the time. So it's just a moment of hope and new beginnings for Curry in many ways. And so this is a way we can, you know, we can look at this painting. And so then, as I mentioned, Curry uses the sunrise motif after this. This is where I see it starting to show up all the time. I don't see it as often before this period. And he um, makes use of, use of it. It becomes almost a signature motif for him. He, he, in his dedications to books that he illustrated, he actually draws a little picture of the sunrise. And I'm going to encourage you to see the exhibition because there are other examples in his murals and um, paintings in which he used it, for example, to represent the idea of freedom or emancipation in Civil War imagery, or if it was covered by clouds, sort of used it in a way that might uh, evoke the threat of something, or war, in this case, uh, in one example in the exhibition. So I really encourage you to, you know, take a look at the rest of what I, I, the case that I was trying to make about uh, Curry's use of the sunrise. We are open till eight after this program is over. Okay, so now I'm gonna let Kenneth take over. Okay, I'm Kenneth Bay and I am the painting conservator from Omaha, Nebraska at the Ford Conservation Center or the Gerald R. Ford Conservation Center. It is a regional nonprofit conservation facility for all types of art objects, uh, paintings, works on paper and three-dimensional objects. And we are uh, run under History Nebraska, a state organization, but we work for art collections all over the country and certainly within a day's drive of of Omaha from Wichita to uh, Sioux Falls and from Cedar Rapids to Western Nebraska. And certainly a lot of collections here in Kansas are among our favorites to work with, especially the Beach Museum. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here today to talk about some of the work that I do and specifically one project, the sunrise painting in this exhibition, which was a very special uh, endeavor and to tell you about its condition problems and a solution that we all agreed with would be the way to go forth with this painting. 
but more on that in just a moment. This is my laboratory. Uh, it's sort of a um, exaggerated panoramic photo view, but it does show the various types of equipment which are connected with the different types of procedures that I have to do in the lab. For example, the metallic table on the left-hand side is a heated suction table, which is important for bringing down distortions, flaking paint and such, and most importantly, uh, lining paintings, adhering them to new backings to prolong the life of a picture. So these, are standard procedures in conservation labs, but our lab in Omaha has uh, a nice assortment of the necessary tools and materials to handle the range of problems that I find. Um, I'll just give you, uh, I'll throw it out there that in 13 years of being here, there's been hardly a problem I haven't been able to solve with the tools and the techniques and the know-how that we have. Uh, however, we are not outfitted to do high-end scientific analysis and research like a lab at the Metropolitan or the National Gallery, for example, would be. We're here to solve the problems in the Great Plains states, um, painting collections, and solve them in a practical and affordable manner. This is what the conservation lab pretty much really looks like if I stand uh, on the counter and look down. And it, yes, it does get this crowded sometimes. I have a, in this particular photograph, I have a, um, a group of large paintings from the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha. Um, do you recognize the fellow in the lower left as Herbert Hoover? That actually is from the Herbert Hoover presidential uh, site in uh, Branchville, Iowa. And you see, I have tables in the foreground where I can work flat. Those are sections of Grant Wood's corn room mural of 1928 that were uh, recovered from the now destroyed decorated room that he painted for the Chieftain Hotel in Council Bluffs, which is just across the river from Omaha. So I have a number, have had a number of those come through the lab. And then you see the windows, you see uh, ventilation trunks for extracting uh, bad toxic fumes, and most importantly, easels. So I'm doing my work flat horizontally, and I'm work doing my work uh, vertically on easels for cleaning and retouching, for example. Uh, and it's most importantly, it's all my own room. I work in this large sort of 30 by 40 foot room with 20 foot ceilings all the time with the doors shut closed off from the outside world. To any of you, if that sounds like social distancing, it really is. But now more to the point of what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this, which is this fascinating painting, which Liz has already told you about its history and perhaps some of the reasons, the role it played in Curry's life as an artist. Uh, it was brought to the Ford Center in 2016, after it had already gone through uh, the advice and the study of conservators at the Nelson Atkins, at Buffalo State College, where they uh, did some very impressive work to analyze the problems that it had in the laboratory. They did some analysis of cross sections of paint and some chemical analysis. Uh, to determine what was wrong. If you have stared at this painting for a little while now, you'll see already it looks very different in this photograph than what you see in the exhibition. You see a vast difference right there in the center of the painting, and the heart and the soul of the painting is the sun, which has discolored or had discolored to sort of a sickly brownish grayish yellow and very, very uneven. Uh, the sun itself and a number of the, the area of rays radiating away from it in a very um, uneven pattern. This is how the painting came to the beach. This is how they acquired it uh, in 1996. And if it looks unpresentable to you in this form, that's exactly how it was considered for the whole time until uh, well, until recently, of course, but it was treated uh, in 
by 2017 in my laboratory. To back up a little bit further, um, no uh, great painting escapes some kind of a treatment, and even some non-great paintings don't escape treatment. Uh, it had been to a conservation lab, I don't know where or who it was, at some point earlier, and during this time it received a pretty standard lining that is uh, a wax adhesive, uh, a wax-based adhesive that bonded the painting, the original canvas, to a secondary lining canvas. So that brown canvas you see uh, when you look from the back of the painting and then the very light colored wooden stretcher are all new replacements or new additions to the painting that were uh, put on. And I'm going to guess it was done perhaps sometime in the 1970s. It looks a little bit like a 1970s type of a treatment, but don't quote me on that date. I cannot date precisely when it was treated unless we have actual records. This is a lining uh, going on on one of those Grant Wood uh, mural sections from Council Bluffs. And this strip on the bottom photograph shows it on that lining table, which draws a gentle vacuum under a sheet of uh, heat resistant mylar that we call Dartec, and sandwiched between the painting and the polyester canvas that it is going to be lined on is a one one thousandth of an inch thick layer of uh, formulated adhesive that we call Biva, Biva 371 which melts conveniently at exactly 150 degrees. So I can do a very controlled kind of bonding of the original work of art canvas to the new canvas at that temperature under a vacuum. Very convenient. This technique used to be done with wax and with glue paste adhesives. Uh, since the 19th, maybe even the 18th century, using very high pressure with heated iron tools and many, many great pictures around the world, while they were saved by the lining, which gave them the strength to stay on a wall to the next generation, it also flattened out the character of the picture, the brush strokes, the texture, the micro sculpture that a painting has that's inherent in the brushwork. Many people think of paintings as beautiful images that we can see reproduced in a coffee table book or on uh, the, the walls of a post of the poster. But in fact, a painting is also sculpture when you look at it in relief with three dimension. Uh, this painting actually uh, with the wax lining was very carefully lined and it has beautiful brush texture throughout. And that is something to be very uh, much aware of and to be very happy with when you have a painting that has its texture. That's why I'm showing you this raking light photograph that shows the relief, the fine sort of chiseled relief of the brush textures. So we look at paintings in different light and we can look at paintings at angled light, um, visible light, of course. And uh, one way is to look at the short end of the uh, radiation beyond the visible into the ultraviolet. And this would be like going into a, uh, you know, a, go, when you go into a discotheque at night, you might see the dandruff on your shoulder or differences that, that is because different materials will fluoresce or not fluoresce depending on their um, properties on their makeup. And so newer editions of paint will not develop uh, to the point where they have a fluorescence like the original older layers of paint. That's just a very general um, assumption here. And it's very convenient for us because the dark anomalies you see in an ultraviolet fluorescence view like this show up easily as the areas where it was last restored. Um, in this painting, you see those scratchy areas in the middle, those linear places. Those are right along cracks, severe cracks in the painting that were retouched. Uh, you can still see those cracks, in fact. Uh, they are there to stay on the painting. And then a lot of restoration in the 
upper left, that very uneven pattern, speckled area, and a little blob on the right-hand side. So this just gives you an idea of where someone who was there before a re restorer had put his mark in um, retouching the painting. It also gives you an indication of the condition of the painting, which was more damaged or abraded in the upper left, um, and then had, of course, those existing uh, damages in the sun. What's interesting, though, in this picture is also that that discolored area of the sun is uh, different in fluorescence. It's darker and has a more yellowish appearance. And that's clearly visible in this image you see. And here we are again to compare how we see it in normal light on the right and on the left, that view I just showed you of the ultraviolet fluorescence. And here's that area in the upper left. So it's very good when uh, I receive a painting to become familiar with all the different ways of looking at it, the different aspects to get to know the picture. And I would say, to be quite honest, I spent a lot more time thinking and worrying about this painting than actually doing the treatment. And that's, that's important too, because I guess we're, we're paid to think. Yes, another view of before the treatment. So to back up, uh, the painting had been uh, looked at at Buffalo State College by a student and had been regarded by uh, the chief conservator of the Nelson Atkins, Mary Schaefer. And with their advice, after, after all of that was done, they suggested bringing it to the Ford Center for the actual treatment to be done. So that was just my small part of this more extensive project. I'm giving you a close up now of that sun. So you will get to know it over and over again. You won't forget it because you can't see it this way in the exhibition itself when you look at the actual painting. I should mention that before treatment record shots of how artwork appear is also a very important part of conservation to keep that documentation. So we, of course, have all these images in our records and the beach will have them as well uh, forever so they can be regarded. I didn't realize I took so many pictures to include in the PowerPoint. I must have been trying to make this lecture go as long as it could go so we could linger on it. But here we are. This is a close-up of one of that, the discolored area. We are not exactly sure how and why it discolored. There are some good guesses though. Curry is fascinating because he was an experimenter and he was very interested in his own time, what was being, proposed, put forth, regarded as a revival of old master techniques. In particular, uh, 19, the early 30s saw the publication of Max Derner, that's D-O-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E Max Derner's uh, The uh, Materials and Techniques of the Old Masters book. A German artist, writer who was espousing what he believed was a revival, was a reconsideration, was a rediscovery of the methods that the old masters use. We're talking about in the Renaissance and in the mid Middle Ages, in particular, the use of egg tempera, for example. And Curry is interested in these books, Max Derner's book, a book by Maroget, another uh, uh, artist and uh, writer, and he started experimenting. And we don't even know how much he experimented because he, while he did a lot of documentation and note-taking of what he was working through, uh, we think probably he was experimenting even further with, in ways that are not documented. And one of these might be apparent in the painting that we're regarding today. Uh, these are some of the materials. You can see turpentine, you can see different types of oil, linseed, stand oil, uh, use of 
of uh, resins like um, Damar resin. And so conservators have been very curious and tried to reconstruct some of these, um, these recipe formulations in the laboratory to understand what was curry actually after, what was he going after and how was he using them? And more importantly, how did they behave once he applied them to a painting? Uh, we have scant documentation of how this painting looked. There's a very early photograph in black and white of the Beaches painting in the living room of the original owner. And it does seem to show a pretty unblemished area of light or whitish sun in the center, but it's not a completely dependable image. It is blurry, an old black and white photograph. Uh, this is the later 1940. Uh, one sunrise painting, which is in the exhibition on loan. And here we see clearly that he had uh, an intent for the sun to be bright, luminous, and also dynamic, that it has brushstroke and variation within that orb. And here you see it again, you see radiating sunlight and you see a not homogeneous, but a rather varied sun that's painted in the center with a lot of luminosity. At least there's a lot of expression in the texture of the paint. And here again is the original. We basically had a very much hindered image that could not be shown as what we believe Curry intended in the state that it was received when the uh, museum acquired it. So what are we looking at here all of a sudden? This is a 17th century portrait by Franz Hals, which I treated uh, back around 2000 in the Cleveland Museum of Art, where I was before. And um, the idea behind treating this was to mask this area to leave the original paint intact because it's Curry's original but discolored paint. Um, and let me just back up a little bit further. When I was showing you those notes that he took and the, the formulations, we believe he used an oil resin mixture which discolored, that is a mixture of oil and varnish, possibly also gum Arabic. And we're not exact, exactly sure what pigments, uh, what white pigment he was using, but somehow the combination of the media that he used, the formulation caused that area to discolor. And it was the application of a certain formulation of paint media over just the sun area, he probably meant to heighten to make that area visually more stunning and more, maybe more glossy, maybe whiter. But in fact, the opposite happened. Over time, it became darker and more disfiguring and distracting from the image. So sometimes this can happen. And I, what I wanna show you in this next image is a painting through no fault of its own um, became altered and that escutcheon or emblem that you see in the upper right of the picture on the, 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 the state of the Franz Hals on the left is how the Cleveland Museum of Art acquired the painting in 1999. And the uh, blue pigments in it are uh, contain Prussian blue, which wasn't invented until roughly a hundred years after the painting was painted. And even the style of the painting is 18th century. However, it's very important that the museum retain that piece of evidence of the painting and never physically get rid of it because it is the only uh, aspect, the only evidence of this painting that ties it to Mr. Tielman Rustermann, who was one of the wealthiest um, patrons of Franz Hals and a neighbor of his. So it's extremely important. And to this painting, we can also tie a neighbor picture of the, uh, the wife, which is in a different collection. So after curatorial consultation and discussion, a lot of consideration, it was decided that conservation, i.e. me, would uh, retouch, after cleaning the painting, would retouch 
that escutcheon out by overpainting it, first neutralizing it and then matching the brush strokes of the bristle strokes of the very thinly painted background so it looks like it's not there. And I visited this painting back again several times over the years and I still can't really find so easily where I retouched it, which is a good sign. Uh, and you ask, why do that? Well, because the picture did not have that discussion in the first place. And Hals intended the picture to have uh, space around the sitter, around the man standing. And in particular, it relates better with its pendant, the wife painting, when both of them are painted out. So uh, this brings me to the point that paintings should best be seen with the original intent that the artist had, the original concept, the original look that they would have had. I'll give you another example. Uh, this is a picture I treated only about um, 10 days ago um, on, the on site at the Spencer Museum in Lawrence at the um, University of Kansas. And in the center is a, uh, a big blob of overpaint that's right in the center. This picture is already on view. It's part of their exhibition of their installations in the gallery. And although it really could stand to be completely cleaned, uh, this is a quick solution for me to go back with the, my retouching and to, uh, and actually I'll tell you, it matches much, much better than my iPhone was able to capture that photo in. It's completely invisible to the naked eye. And this is a way to mask off that disfigurement that's in the center of the painting. I accomplish the retouching just by very, very minimal light dippings into uh, a palette of dry pigments with a minimal amount of resin. In this case, it's, uh, it's a PVA, a polyvinyl acetate, uh, the AYAB formula. For those of you who are painting conservators out there and want to know exactly what I use, it's easily dissolvable in ethanol or isopropyl alcohol. And it's put on in a very thin, minimal amount of added resin to these pigments, very thin wisps. And, uh, and here I had uh, more retouching that I did in the upper left area where it was decided that that dark blue pattern in the upper left corner wasn't right. And that was largely reconstructed by the last restorer. And here you see a difference between the left and the right. On the right is uh, after a lot of sort of consultation back and forth with Liz Seaton, we decided upon this look that would be more in keeping with the style of Curry and certainly the rest of this painting. And so here you see, finally, um, and we're just about at the end now, um, the work that I did in retouching, in uh, applying very thin, minimal, wispy strands of paint to the sun. And the core of what I have really to share with you is that it was done minimally and done with a lot of respect to the existing brush strokes and to color patterns that I could already sense going on in the sun, even with its discoloration, some of the, uh, the uh, underlayers of pink and yellow and white and interactions with colors in the sky, uh, all that could be respected by adding minimal wisps of brush strokes, just the tip of the top one or two or three hairs of the sable brush, applying this, these white, whitish strokes and allowing some of the original to show through, but certainly minimizing the disfigurement of the discoloration so that when you go and look at the painting now in the exhibition, it shouldn't be apparent that anyone was there at all doing the work that I did. So this is the look of the picture today. I would rather you see the painting in reality and regard it and consider for yourselves, what would you do with a painting that has the disfigurement in it? It is certainly not, or was not the artist's original intent. 
And for a painting that is about the sun and about the sunrise, it strikes at the very core of the visual impact, but also the meaning of the painting. If the meaning is about the sun and its sunrise, and it's impaired by its visual condition, then the museum doesn't show the painting and it doesn't really serve its, its important function. But treated, and now in the context of comparable works that can be seen in this theme exhibition, I think it's, it's quite a triumph to be able to put a picture back on view with just this, these little wisps of color that could only have gone on after um, the really admirable work of uh, the conservator, the conservation student Ellen Davis at the Buffalo State College, and then the consideration and advice of Mary Schaefer at the Nelson Atkins. And then finally, the, uh, the willingness of the Beach Museum to move forward and research this project and put this in the hands of the Ford Conservation Center. So thank you very much. And I hope you've had some sort of appreciation of what goes on in the conservation lab from this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Oh, I need to speak up, but this will be going to live the, <laughs> to the people who are watching via Zoom. So does anyone have a question for Kenneth? Anyone in the audience here? I, oh, go ahead, yeah. So the question that was just asked is, do I clean the paintings, do all, all the paintings that I'm later going to eventually work on and retouch like I am, and what is the process of that? And actually, that's a very good question because you notice I really only talked about retouching a painting and that's it. The kind of the ground rules that were laid down for this project is this painting has already been cleaned. It has a varnish layer. The only consideration here is what to do about this disfiguration. So let's bring it to the Ford Center and let's commission them to deal with the retouching and let's deal with the retouching by putting on an appropriate material that can mask off and alter that and put it hopefully back in its original form. I would say this is one of the very few projects I've had in 13 years that had me just do that specific amount of work. Most paintings that I get, yes, have to be cleaned and have to be cleaned even if they come in with a small little damage that has to be repaired. Cleaning is often very much a part of it. Cleaning can be dirt removal from the paint layer, which you have to think of as a porous layer that collects the dirt into its surface, or it could be cleaning of an existing varnish layer that comes off kind of like removing the polyurethane on your floor before you resand it and refinish your floor. Um, so yes, cleaning is a big, big topic. And I did not have to do that in this particular case, but I usually almost always have to accomplish that with uh, solvents and cleaning solutions that are more uh, water-based. Yes. Unless it's proprietary information, what was the ratio of thinking to Yes. Yes. Well, if I count the nights that I was sleepless and worried at night all night about how am I going to treat the painting, let me ask this question again. Uh, the question was, Approximately how much did I have to think in ratio to the actual treatment? And it's not unusual for me to put, you know, I'm thinking all the time, even when I'm working on other projects, I'm working on an easy project while I'm worried about that one over there across the room. And uh, I would say it's possible I spent about 15 times more time considering and worrying than actually doing the time of treating. And right now I'm treating a very badly damaged painting for Creighton University that has horrible water damaged flaking up and down. And I've had that painting in my lab now for two years, considering 
maybe a little bit less than two years, but it's been staring at me in the face for a long, long time while I considered, should I do this first or that first and do it this way or do it that way? And I finally plowed ahead on it last week and it's done, it's all done. So that, that, that can happen. And I think I heard a conservator once said he was also paid to think in addition to actually doing the work. <laughs> The question is, what led me to doing conservation work? And do I do artwork on the side? Uh, yes, I love drawing, especially, and making images and, and, the, and the quickness of, of doing. I like to do things quickly if I can. So maybe that's why I like to do drawing. But uh, I got into art conservation through the study of art history and through the interest also in the sciences. It was not just a way to combine these two areas, but actually it's much more simple than that. I just wanted to get as close as I could to a museum object and touch it and have some impact. When I was a small kid, um, I was caught climbing onto the elephant display at the Museum of Natural History Museum in New York City and I got yelled at by the guard. And ever since then, I've wanted to get, get closer to that elephant. And so this is a way that I can actually get close and have works of art. A painting is not really a painting to me until it has its, it's out of its frame and on the easel. And I can turn it around and look at the back of it and understand through and through everything about it. And it's a great way also to understand the history of artwork by knowing the pieces physically. Fascinating, Kenneth. My question is, as a historian, I am curious about how much research goes into restoring or touching up a painting. Do colors and paints change over time? Do you have to research what colors or tools were commonly used to the era of the painting you're restoring? Yeah, so the question is, um, let me back up again. Uh, how much research do I have to do on a painting? And the use of colors and pigments, how much do I have to understand the paint pigments that go into it? And do they change over time? I mean, this is an excellent example, for example, of a painting where one should understand the history and the techniques and the materials and the pigments and how they change over time. But I would say, yes, in general, uh, especially when I worked with the Cleveland Museum collection, I had to understand very much about what, what was the, the milieu, the environment, the artistic environment that a painting was created in. Is this a work by Velazquez from its early, his early period or his middle period? Or what type of underlayers was he using? And what were the intents of these pictures? So that's very important to understand throughout history. At the Ford Conservation Center, I work with a lot of very sort of unknown pictures that come from a myriad of directions in Nebraska. They are painted by someone's grandmother, or they come from an obscure artist who's not known outside of Nebraska. And I pretty much have to get to know these unusual artists on the spot. It's a great treat to work with an artist like Curry because we know comparatively a lot about him. And we have a lot of people studying him as an artist and understanding his techniques. Now, going to pigments and understanding pigments, uh, we have a large variety of pigments available to us as conservators in the conservation lab, but throughout history up until the 19th and then especially into the 20th century, there's a limited range of pigments that we really need to know about. And we can find shortcuts to getting the effect of some of these old pigment uh, impact, uh, the results that artists in the old master got by using substituting modern pigments and alterations and using glazings. I should mention that retouching is done not just in one brush stroke, but is usually many, many glazes by a conservator to get that visual impact. That's in general, but not so with say contemporary art, which is often one absolutely single hue color that comes out of a tube that a particular artist might use. So that's a different challenge altogether. So I would say for most of art history, I can handle all the pigments and pigment issues that I have 
that I'm confronted with, but when I have to deal with a contemporary artist, an artist who's working today or was just working in the last few decades, those are my biggest problems to solve and to understand what is going on with the condition problems. I hope I was able to answer that. It's, that's actually a rather complicated uh, question and there are many angles by which one has to kind of consider it. We have one other um, question from the Zoom audience. Um, this is a former student of mine, a curatorial student assistant who worked with me on this exhibition. I have to give credit to Abby Lynn for her, a lot of the research she did and some of her ideas about what to include in the exhibition. So her question is, I am curious to know how you maintain a level of cohesiveness in the painting after touching it up. In other words, how do you prevent the areas you have painted from standing out as a new layer of paint and to look like they were painted at the same time as the rest of the painting? Oh, that's a great question. So how do I make everything coherent and whole and integrated in the picture, even after I've done retouching here, there, and everywhere? And how do I keep those areas that I've, where I've been recently from standing out? And that pretty much is the challenge. That's what I'm doing all the time. I'm, uh, people ask, well, do you paint? It must be fun to paint on a curry or on a Rembrandt or whatever. And the trick is to hide inside that small little square centimeter of damage and to mimic the look of that artist and the look of that painting down to the minutest microscopic detail to, imitate the thickness of the paint, the texture, the surface quality, the gloss when I'm all done, and especially the layering of pigments so that I fool the eye into not ever realizing that there's a replacement of that damaged area of painting. That's really great when I have all the information around an area of loss or damage. And I know exactly what goes in. If I know I have this original area and this original area and this and this, I know what goes in the center, even if it has to be a little bit of reconstruction of a detail. When I have a painting, like a portrait painting from the Renaissance and he's missing his entire lower arm or so, now we're getting into really dicey territory and we have uh, many paintings uh, that have large areas of loss that have to be reconstructed and not just reconstructed for form, but getting the right tone and shadow and resilience and all the qualities that that original artist had. And that is the trick when you have to deal with heavy damages on paintings. So let me just back up a little bit. In some schools of restoration in Italian, medieval paintings, for example, they use little straight lines that blend together when you stand back, but up close they look like little straight distinctive color lines called trategio, and they want you to know what is replacement and what is not uh, the original. And in a lot of Asian scroll and screen painting, they will purposely use a different uh, sense of form or color so that you will, so those areas of addition will stand out. So it's specifically in a lot of Western, what I mean is European and American uh, painting conservation that we want it to be deceptive and we want it to be invisible from six feet away and start to become visible from six inches away. So we call that the six foot, six inch principle. I wanted to, oh, sorry, just one thing I wanted to say. The first Zoom question was from my current student curatorial assistant, um, Hannah Palsa, who is doing, helping with continuing research on Curry. I'm gonna meet with one of his family members, so she was helping me prepare for that meeting. So anyway, the work continues and we have great uh, help here from Kansas State University students. Uh, you had a question, Linda? Light, the sun, or like that peculiar visual effect that the 
the ice crystals in the air that makes it fun dog. I mean, I I think that takes a lot of thoughts to, to do that. I just wondered what your thoughts were about Curry's audacity to put the brightness of the sun right in the center. Yes. So the question, the, the comment really, and it's a good one, is the audacity of this artist, of John Stuart Curry, to attempt to emote, to create, to express the brilliance, the impact of that bright sun on a Kansas morning, right in the center of the picture, like you see it. And yes, I, uh, in a way, He's doing something personally very gratifying for him. I believe that given your biographical background on him and these paintings. And it also is in a way Curry's um, one-upmanship on the old masters, on the people who came before him. Think um, William uh, Mallard Turner, who created many, many great sunsets and sunrises and the impact of weather and meteorology and the sun and the sky and Constable and uh, artists like the, the, a lot of the, the great American artists, um, Frederick Edwin Church and the Hudson River School. And going down the line, uh, many of these artists took up that challenge to paint that, that sun, which we see every day, hopefully, and, um, and in, Kansas with these, uh, I should mention it, we think it's Barber County and it's uh, the area to the south, um, of southwest of, of Wichita, bordering on the border near, was it? Uh, Medicine, Medicine Lodge is, yeah. Medicine Lodge mm -hmm. is the center of this area. I've just gotten to know Kansas geography in a, in a snap uh, brush up before this talk, we, we looked up where Barber, it's known for its red soil and that complementary colors of red and green is just so dazzling in the foreground. If you may notice there's a coyote or a wolf in the foreground bringing a rabbit to its den. And so there's all kinds of exuberance of life going on in this painting. So I don't know if I've really answered your question, but in a way I added a comment on top of your great comment. Oh, mentioned Turner. That, that's so yeah. Well, it's six, a little past 6.30, so I think we should conclude this program. And I wanna thank the audience who participated via Zoom and all of you who came in person. Um, we're delighted to see you here and hope you will enjoy the exhibition uh, while the museum is open until eight o'clock.